John Gotti was a violent and reckless hoodlum from his earliest days. Henry Hill, a young gangster, was drinking in a bar when he first came across the teenage Gotti. All of a sudden, John comes in, that puts it up. work anyway, goes over to the card table and starts whacking the guy with a batter or something, with a batter or a pipe or something. Just beating his guy to hit to death. He almost killed the guy. And he, he might have killed the guy, I don't know. The guy might have died, you know, they might have thrown him Trump that night, I don't know. Gotti had broken an unwritten rule of the mob. Violence should only be used when there are no witnesses. He walks over, apologizes to me. <laughs> Come all over the place. That was the first time I had ever seen me. He had a long black, uh, you know, top coat, leather, leather top coat, you know. I mean, he, he just looked a part of a, you know, of uh, a gangster. It was clear Gotti feared no one. To Henry Hill, it marked Gotti as a man destined for the top. He was a man on the rise. He was, you know, he, he had his own crew. You, you know, he was, he was going to be somebody, you know. You just knew it. I mean, he, he had that presence. But one man stood in the way of Gotti's rise. Paul Castellano. He was the head of the Gambino crime family the most powerful of all the Mafia families in the U.S. Castellano was an old-style hood, a mafioso who disguised his crimes behind a veneer of respectability. Paul wore two hats. He could mingle with lawyers, real estate, medicine and developers, doctors, talk their language. Then he wore his Gambino family hat, and he could sit there and discuss why this guy's got to get killed and say, okay, he's got to go. Gotti would have to eliminate Castellano to become boss. But Gotti was not the only one who wanted him out of the way. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan declared war on organized crime. The target was the Mafia's ruling body known as the Commission. On it sat Paul Castellano. Under America's tough anti-mafia RICO legislation, crime fighters could prosecute Castellano and the other bosses for running a criminal enterprise, if they could prove the commission was meeting. The commission was so secret, the only proof the FBI had was from 1957, when police raided an infamous mob gathering. Then, one morning in 1984, FBI agent Joe O'Brien received a call from a mole inside the Mafia. He informed me that there was going to be what's known as a Mafia Commission meeting in a couple of hours. Uh, I didn't believe him, to be honest with you, because uh, this was pretty much unheard of. These guys cannot afford to meet. Um, it could be very incriminating to them. If the FBI could get a photograph of this meeting, it would help destroy the commission. O'Brien and fellow agent Andy Currens staked out this building, a small house on Cameron Avenue, Staten Island, that belonged to a relative of a senior mafia don. The agents hid in the back of an unmarked van a few hundred yards down the road. The van was right back here, right about where the white car is, right in front of the uh, 54 there. That's about uh, where we were parked. And we had a nice straight shot. There were no cars at that time. We had a straight shot down the, uh, down the street to 34 camera. So we sat there for uh, three hours, so about 4.30. And then they started coming out crime family by crime family. The top men in the Gambino, the Lucchese, the Colombo, and the Genovese families all emerged. Then finally our uh, long-awaited uh, guest of honor, if you will, uh, Paul Castellano came out. Castellano 
was the boss of bosses. It was like the king strutting out. You could almost envision a carpeted area. It was a real show of, of how the mob operates and mob protocol. It was very exciting. Uh, I don't know how Andy managed to keep the camera as still as he did. He used this shoulder right here as a tripod, and uh, I just didn't breathe uh, for the longest period of time. Castano wasn't in any, any big rush. Took a couple of puffs in the cigar and uh, got in the car and drove off. The photographs were dynamite. The FBI knew that such striking visual evidence was just the thing to put in front of a jury. In February 1985, the FBI seized all five members of the commission. Agents O'Brien and Currens arrested Castellano and drove him to FBI headquarters in Manhattan. Federal authorities and New York City and state law enforcement officials today announced one of the most important indictments of mafia bosses in this nation's history. In the car on the way to FBI headquarters, Castellano heard a radio news bulletin about the arrests. It was the beginning of the end of Castellano's reign. Made their move late last night. Among those now facing federal racketeering and extortion charges are Paul Castellano, head of the Gambino family. The key to the investigation was an electronic bug. He turned to Joe, I remember, and he says, is that true? Is that true? You listened to my private conversations. Prosecutors say the recordings are of superb quality. You could almost hear him, like, groan. The agents thought Castellano was squirming because they had taped his criminal conversations. But Castellano realized they had also learned about his secret affair with his young Colombian maid. This was very embarrassing to him. It's a little embarrassing to us, too, for that matter. He's almost like a little boy now, confessing this uh, something that he did was bad. He's not talking about it was bad that I murdered people or had on my authority people were murdered. It's it's I'm embarrassed because I had this relationship with this young woman who was my maid, you know, right under my wife's nose. This was a revelation a Mafia Don could not afford. He'd broken one of Mafia's most sacred rules. It was okay to maim and murder but not to publicly dishonor your wife. Castellano awaited trial where the photos would be key evidence. If the New York mob wanted to know what a mafia war was like, they needed to look no further than Sicily. Here, the Mafia's boss was Toto Riina, an elusive, psychopathic killer from the town of Corleone. Corleone was a Mafia stronghold set high in the mountains of central Sicily. It was the place that gave its name to Marlon Brando's character in the film The Godfather. Riina's cruelty earn him the name The Beast. Corleone had an unenviable reputation as a place where only the toughest mafiosi were born and bred. As one local anti-mafia fighter remembers. I once met a Corleone mafia person and he looked me straight in the eye and said, Listen, to be a real man, you need to have spent a few years in jail. This is the philosophy of the Corleone Mafia. For them, going to jail is like a baptism. A Mafia member who hasn't been to jail isn't a real mafioso. Riina's crime family had seized control of the Mafia in a vicious war. In Palermo, in the early 80s, the streets were soaked with the blood of Rina's victims. 
During one six-month period, a body was found in the city every three days. Palermo's mayor was Leo Luca Orlando, elected to office promising to end such crimes. Even 20 years later, his courageous stand means he must have an armed guard 24 hours a day. Palermo was a city just living in silence and in dark. The way the citizens to avoid to be involved in these killings was to deny that the, that the mafia uh, does exist. Just to say, we don't see, we don't speak, we don't hear. Uh, it's not our problem. They kill each other. There's no risk for us. If we don't speak about the mafia, we, we, we will never be killed. The man leading the hunt for Rina was an investigating magistrate named Judge Giovanni Falcone. He had grown up in a rough area of Palermo, where some of his schoolboy friends later became mafiosi. Unlike them, he had chosen to fight for the law rather than against it. From his headquarters in Palermo's Palace of Justice, Falcone had been battling the mafia for over a decade. In 1987, he enjoyed his greatest victory. In the Maxi trial, over 300 mafiosi have been sent to prison, their sentences totaling almost 3,000 years. It was the most stunning blow the Sicilian mafia had ever received. But Mafia boss Toto Rina had escaped the roundup. He remained free, running his criminal empire from an unknown hiding place. Falcone faced another danger, this one closer to home. He had few friends at the Palace of Justice. The people of Palermo stood on the sidelines, waiting to see who would come out on top. Falcone for the Mafia. Falcone rented a vacation apartment on the beach, half an hour's drive from Palermo. When he went there, it seemed that most of Palermo knew about it. When Falcone was on the move, it was like a wedding party. There were lots of cars, even a helicopter in the sky above. So everyone knew that Falcone was at the beach house. Yet the ring of steel that protected Falcone made little difference to Riina. One afternoon in June 1989, Falcone relaxed by the beach. An inquisitive security guard noticed the sports bag by the house, seemingly forgotten in the rocks by the water's edge. When he peered inside the bag, he noticed electric wires connected to 58 sticks of plastic explosives. The bag was wired to explode if it was picked up. The bomb did not go off. Falcone had cheated death. Soon after the assassination attempt, Falcone spoke to one of his closest friends in the fight against the mafia. He made a chilling prediction. When we were talking afterwards, he told me, my life's mapped out. It's my destiny to be killed by the Mafia someday. The only thing I don't know is when. With Rina at large, Falcone was running out of time. Back in New York, the clock was also ticking for the American godfather, Paul Castellano. A 
Castellano waited for his trial on racketeering charges. He rarely ventured from his home, this luxurious mansion in the most exclusive area of Staten Island. Enemies and friends alike called it the White House, and Castellano lived like a president. That meant he lost touch with feelings on the street, discontent that would be exploited by his rival, John Gotti. There's a lot of uh, discontent with Castellano where they thought he was too involved in his legal trials, he wasn't running the family. It had become a family of the haves and have-nots. Castellano was making all the money. Guys like Gotti were out there starving. So there was a lot of dissension in the family. We knew there was meetings going on and there was a lot of discontent. In fact, Gotti posed as a have-not to win support for his bid to become boss. In reality, Gotti was making a fortune dealing heroin, making him a hero to his supporters. The law was onto Gotti's crew for drug dealing. That brought more heat on Castellano. So he planned to break up Gotti's crew. Gotti knew he had to act. The stage was set for a showdown. On December 16th, 1985, Castellano headed into Manhattan for a meeting with Gotti. They were to meet here at Castellano's favorite steakhouse, Sparks, in Midtown Manhattan. Inside the restaurant, Castellano and his driver were shot dead. Such a daring public murder shocked New Yorkers. It made the new Gambino boss a celebrity overnight. At the time, Gotti was facing a trial on a charge of racketeering. Until the murder, few outside the world of law enforcement had even heard of Gotti. We went from having what was really kind of a, not sleepy, but routine organized crime case to the case, the case of the decade. We had huge throngs of reporters outside the courthouse, in the courtroom. We had, we had a big fish on the line. At his trial, Gotti was defended by flamboyant mob lawyer Bruce Cutler. For many years, Cutler has continued to act as Gotti's apologist. He had a, a remarkable insight into others, uh, like a sense, almost a, 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 a sixth sense, if you will, to size people up. Gotti could certainly size up a jury. In March 1987, the trial reached its conclusion. Gotti was acquitted of racketeering. But unknown to law officers, a juror had been bribed by one of Gotti's men. Gotti was tried in two other cases, both for assault, both defended by Bruce Cutler. I'll say you with respect to defendant John Gotti, guilty or not guilty? You find him not guilty. Each time, the Gambino boss got off. Bribery and intimidation of witnesses saw to that. The nickname, the Teflon Don, was born. Gotti was different from almost any other godfather. He made little secret he was a mafia Don and enjoyed that everyone knew he'd risen from Brooklyn poverty to become the boss of bosses. He was born dirt poor, was on the street since he's 12, was on the cover of Time magazine in his 40s, and he took on the system. In the opinion of his former attorney, Gotti was a modern-day Robin Hood, standing up to those in power. 
Jewish people, uh, Irish people, working people, union people, construction workers, policemen. My father was a detective. Some of our strongest supporters that used to cheer for us were local police, not because they're allowed to, but it was the alphabetized government thugs we fought. The FBI, Internal Revenue, INS, CIA, those faceless robotic government thugs that come at you and can destroy your life. The murderous reality of Gotti's brutal reign was very different. Gotti's love of public adoration would be exploited by the FBI and prove to be the Teflon Don's undoing. American mob boss John Gotti loved the limelight, but the head of the Sicilian mafia, Totorina, stayed out of sight. Prosecutor Giovanni Falcone was determined to hunt him down. Falcone needed a way of connecting Mafia boss Reina to the crimes carried out in his name by his army of killers. The answer was in America. Richard Martin was a leading official in the U.S. Department of Justice. He and Falcone had worked together for years. Their biggest success, breaking the heroin smuggling link between Sicily and the United States, known as the Pizza Connection. Falcone relished his trips to the U.S. The life that he led in Sicily um, was almost the life of a prisoner. He went from a bulletproof car to a protected office. Instead, when he came to New York, uh, he could go shopping, he could go to restaurants, um, he could come to our offices, we could go to our homes and meet our families uh, together. And so for him, New York was uh, like freedom. Falcone's visits to New York were for more than pleasure. He had been impressed by America's tough anti-mafia laws. Laws that allowed the U.S. government to target Mafia boss Paul Castellano and to bust the commission. I think it also liberated his thinking uh, and, and allowed him to sort of see beyond his own sort of realm coming here. So I think he not only enjoyed it, but I think it was very good for his uh, vision of the way that he was going to attack the Mafia and uh, the way in which he would work with Italian law enforcement. In 1991, a new justice minister took office in Rome, determined to finally crush the Mafia. He offered Falcone a job at the ministry as overlord of the anti-Mafia campaign throughout Italy. Falcone jumped at the chance of leaving Palermo and putting into practice the lessons he had learned in the United States. His ideas were revolutionary. An Italian equivalent of the FBI was to be formed. Across Italy, the fight against organized crime would be centralized under Falcone's control. Riina, the beast from Corleone, felt threatened. A few years before, he had failed to kill Falcone at his beach house. Now, Reina would try again. On May 23rd, 1992, Falcone and his wife, Francesca, returned to Palermo for the weekend. A few miles from the airport, several of Rina's men had placed a half-ton bomb in a drain pipe under the highway that ran from the airport to the city. The men hid in a building above the road. 
armed with a remote control detonator. A massive explosion ripped open the highway. The explosion was so enormous, it registered on local earthquake monitors. Giovanni's sister, Maria Falcone, was at home when she heard the news of the explosion. When my husband told me what had happened, I rushed out of the room. I phoned the police. They told me Giovanni had been taken to hospital. When I got there, Francesca's brother told me Giovanni's dead. This was the saddest moment ever. Not only for me as a sister, but also as an Italian citizen. Because we felt that in losing Giovanni, our greatest chance of beating the Mafia had gone. Falcone was not only a colleague, I was proud. To think of him as a colleague, um, but a friend. Uh, I was enormously saddened, uh, and it was as if um, a part of what we all worked with for had been lost. Riina reputedly threw a party, toasting Falcone's demise with champagne. Along with Falcone, his wife Francesca and three bodyguards were also killed. Thousands gathered at the church of San Domenico in Palermo for the funeral, waiting patiently for hours in the rain. The funeral was broadcast live on national TV. Across Italy, all regular television programs were suspended. Parliament declared a day of mourning. When they asked me what I did when I heard the news, I said I cried. Someone said, you're Judge Ferraro, what do you mean you cried? I replied, yes, I cried, and I'm not in the slightest bit ashamed of it. Italy was shocked and angered. It didn't deter Toto Riina. Anyone who stood in his way would meet a similar fate.